Um, thank you very much. Um, we uh, heard a lot about uh, today the, about the um, German uh, Act on Electronic Securities, and um, given this is an international conference with international issues, we thought it would be interesting to actually talk about the other legal frameworks in Europe for tokenized debt. Um, so I'm here with my colleagues from uh, Paris, London, and uh, our Belgium office, who's actually uh, our expert on Luxembourg law. <laughs> um, and we'll give a brief overview of the different regimes in, in those jurisdictions. Um, I'll start with the German Act on uh, Electronic Securities, but I promise I'll keep it brief. I realize we have heard a lot about that already. Um, and it already ended into force two years ago, so it's um, while it's a relatively new law, it's, uh, it's, it's not that reason that we need to go in, um, you know, provide all the details here in this audience. Um, uh, since, the, since the German Act on uh, Electronic Securities entered into force, um, which is about two years ago now, um, we've seen about 25 issuances under this new regime. So that's about one per month. Um, before this act entered into force, while we didn't have the option to issue um, bearer bonds on the blockchain, um, i.e. bearer bonds in, in tokenized form, uh, we still had the option to, to issue reg registered bonds in tokenized form. And there are actually quite a few issuers who made use of that before that, before the act entered into force. And um, there are quite a few issuers who are still making use of that, um, despite us having this new regime, um, which provides a regulatory framework for the issuance of tokenized debt. So one reason for that is that people are still, or issuers are still turning to this uh, like old option of issuing tokenized debt in the form of registered bonds is that for quite a while there was um, still some legal uncertainty as, um, you know, how this whole process of issuing uh, bearer bonds under the new um, regime works because um, the legislator took actually some time to, um, to publish the relevant implementing regulation. And the other reason is that uh, for issuing registered bonds, there is um, not such a strict regulatory sh regime as there is for the issuance of bearer bonds. For instance, for the issuance of registered tokenized bonds, you don't need a crypto security registrar, um, but can actually do that without a licensed uh, entity. Um, so that's, uh, having said that, we still expect that, uh, you know, the, the issuances of um, tokenized bearer bonds will increase and the issuance of tokenized registered bonds will decrease over time. But as to date, uh, we still see those two forms of tokenized debt. Um, so while we actually uh, do have uh, several options to issue uh, tokenized debt in Germany, um, we don't have the option to uh, issue tokenized equity yet. Um, we hope this will change in the near future. Um, the relevant uh, uh, Future Financing Act um, is expected to be published in draft form in May this year. Um, having said that, it was also announced for January this year and September last year, but um, <laughs> hope dies last, so um, we do expect uh, to see uh, some proposal by the German legislator for the tokenization of debt in Germany uh, pretty soon. Um, before handing over to my uh, colleagues, um, maybe just a few notes from, from our practice um, in, the, in the Capital Markets Group. Um, so to the extent that um, the issuers of the tokenized bearer bonds does require the publication of a prospectus, um, I think it's advisable to keep in mind that the German Act on Electronic Debt Securities, it's a rather new law and the German regulator is known to be very prudent. So in case you need an approved prospectus for the issuance uh, of your bonds, um, just keep that in mind when uh, preparing a timeline. Um, in case you don't need a prospectus, you will always need either a key information document or a securities uh, uh, information document. Um, and the latter does need to be stamped off by the German regulator as well. So that's also something to, to consider. 
And um, if you're an issuer of tokenized debt securities, that might not be relevant to you because you will probably use a licensed entity to actually carry out the services of the crypto security registrar. But if you're a financial institution who intends to apply for a license, um, then just be advised and keep in mind that there is massive backlog of license applications at the moment. So there are a couple of entities who received the provisional permits um, because they were already carrying out these services at a certain point in time. And those who didn't uh, receive this provisional permit are still now waiting for um, the, the license. And that's actually probably taking 12 to 18 months. So that's just... Um, something a lot of financial institutions who are currently considering becoming a licensed crypto security registrar are dealing with. Um, Olga, over to you. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a regime, a legal regime for issuance of um, digital securities, probably with a focus more on debt securities, the bonds, but most of the things I'm going to talk about also with some small carve-outs applies to equity securities in France. And then I will, together with Tom, uh, talk a little bit about the regime in the United Kingdom. So uh, in France, um, like in Germany, like in Luxembourg, we were very much interested in uh, pioneering the issuances of uh, debt, uh, debt securities um, using distributed ledger technology platform. And um, the legislator, realizing that it was important to um, provide certainty on the subject, decided to leverage on the existing capital markets legislation. What it means in simple terms, we used the existing legal framework and just added certain provisions that allow to issue, transfer, and deliver securities, um, security tokens um, on the DLT. DLT basically in this case works as a type of register um, that is uh, there in, in order to ensure the registration of title to the securities and record when the title is passed from one owner to another one. In France, the classic way of issuing securities would be to issue securities in bare form. That dematerialized bare form is what we use in capital markets throughout. However, um, for the security token purposes, the legislator only allowed us a way of issuing securities in registered form. That might change, and this year we expect some legislation reforms that would allow bare, uh, bare notes uh, to be issued as well, but we're not there yet. Up until recently, um, the registered um, dematerialized securities in France could not be admitted to trading, which was obviously not a great thing because those of you who have any um, experience in capital markets, trading is a very big thing. Um, it promotes liquidity, it promotes certainty, um, it opens up investor base. And of course, uh, as uh, our colleagues discussed earlier today, the DLT pilot regime is going to be quite real revolutionary in that sense because it should open up uh, the gates for um, the issuers of securities in France, in Europe, to, um, to, to be able to um, trade the securities. Um, so I think uh, in France, all in all, we have a very clear framework for issuance of uh, digital securities. This, uh, this framework has been already tested multiple times, maybe not in the volumes that Christina can boast for, for the German securities, but um, maybe um, j just, to, uh, just to give you one, uh, f one of the first examples, so EIB in April 2021 issued its first um, digital bonds um, governed under French law. Um, ever since it tested different uh, legal system, including recently, I think, Luxembourg. So um, there are many pilot deals in the pipeline. We're working on some of them with the big French banks. So um, if you have any, uh, any questions on the, uh, the way we do things in France, uh, please, uh, pl please do not hesitate to reach out. And I think I'm going to talk very quickly um, and then we'll pass over to Tom on uh, the regime in the UK. So, um, interestingly, in the United Kingdom, we cannot boast many examples of issuing 
um, digital, digital securities. It's not because English law does not allow uh, for that. English law is very flexible and very commercial. But quite interestingly, I think the perception was that because nobody could point out to a single piece of legislation uh, in England that would regulate digital securities, people thought mm, it's probably safer to, to go and test this instrument in Germany or France or Luxembourg. So the good news is that uh, English law uh, allows allows that, and as a push to promote English law very recently, actually in February this year, um, the UK Jurisdiction Task Force released a very curious paper where it uh, comes to the right conclusions, i.e. that um, the English law is adopted already to issue um, digital securities, both bonds and shares, uh, in registered form, using DLT as a register, um, or even in bare form. And bare form is more uh, interesting one. So in the olden days, bare bond was a piece of paper that was handed from person to person, and whoever owned it actually could claim uh, the money from the issuer. So how would that all function in our DLT platform and digital space? So um, English law actually provides for mechanisms, uh, contractual mechanisms, that would allow to issue a, a, a security token, a bond, for instance, and make sure that the um, owner of this bond can have a direct claim against the issuer, even though they don't have what we, as lawyers, call privity of contract, even though they, there is no contractual relationship between the holder of this asset and the issuer. Uh, equally, the issuer, by paying to the owner, will be deemed to be discharged of its obligations, even though it doesn't have a contract with the owner. And that's, uh, that can be done by many contractual tools. One of them is a famous deed poll that we love using as lawyers because it's easy and uh, it's already recognized by the court practice. So that could be itself incorporated into, um, in, into the terms of the security token. Um, another interesting issue is negotiability of the, um, of the bare bonds issued on uh, DLT. So what is negotiability? It's um, a way, on the one hand, of transferring securities. So uh, whoever owns an asset actually has the full right to this asset. But more importantly, negotiability is certainty that the investor who holds the asset will not be prejudiced, as long as it's a bona fide uh, purchaser, will not be prejudiced by any faults in transfer of legal title of its predecessors. So if somebody down the chain of previous acquirers stole somehow um, the asset, which, which, is, uh, which can equally happen on the DLT, unfortunately, uh, then um, the bona fide purchaser would be protected. So again, there are contractual tools under English law that can help to ensure that, and that in itself creates legal certainty for the market players, for the investors, and um, I think it all promises bright future for English law governed security tokens. Well, now I'm going to pass on to my colleague Tom to give you more interesting stuff. Uh, not at all. Th thanks, Olga. Uh, I absolutely agree with uh, what, what you were saying there. Uh, English law is what could be described as technology neutral uh, with respect to the, the regulation of security tokens. And that has its advantages and disadvantages in some ways. But, but uh, really, what, what, what do we mean by this? What, what, it, what is the, the regime? Uh, the existing regulations uh, apply this in the same way to security tokens as they do to other securities. So, uh, in terms of the, what the, uh, the legal regime underpinning that is, the, uh, English law has clarified that security tokens and crypto assets more broadly are recognized as a form of property, so there is legal certainty in that regard. Uh, Regulatory guidance has also clarified that there are essentially four types of crypto assets. So there are exchange tokens and utility tokens, which are not regulated, and then e-money tokens and security tokens, which are regulated. So regarding security tokens, 
These will qualify as specified investments under the Financial Services and Markets Act. And the FCA, the UK regulator, has published some, some guidance uh, clarifying what the regulatory approach, i.e. That, that existing law applies to security tokens. So what does this mean in practice? Essentially, any entity carrying out regulated activities with respect to specified investments by way of business in the UK uh, will require FCA authorization. Um, the, the, the UK government has proposed to expand this to cover activities provided in or to the UK, largely to address some of the difficulties in assessing where certain activities with respect to crypto assets actually take place, as well as to prevent any sort of regulatory arbitrage. I think it's also uh, important to, to note that it's not always clear when a token will be a security token uh, and, th and therefore fall within the regulatory perimeter. Uh, very broadly speaking, where a token confers a, a, an ownership right equivalent to a share or establishes a creditor relationship, uh, the same as debt, uh, that then it then it will be a specified investment and and fall within that regulatory parameter. But uh, it, sometimes a case by case analysis will be necessary. Finally, just to, uh, to to be clear, the issuance of security tokens is not of itself a regulated activity in the same way that a company issuing shares or issuing debt isn't isn't regulated per se. However. Uh, if there's an issuance of security tokens, uh, of transferable securities, uh, that, that is to the public, or securities that are admitted to a, a regulated uh, exchange, then, then a prospectus would need to be published uh, unless an exemption applies. So I think that's a, a whistle-stop tour of the, the, the existing uh, UK regulatory uh, framework. And over to Willem. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, maybe some observations from our Luxembourg office. Luxembourg does not have any uh, natural resources and, and not uh, something as a real bank secrecy anymore. So it's a jurisdiction that is very much focused on uh, front-running uh, a legal framework uh, for innovative technologies, be it in, in financial technology, in space law, and so on. So I think very early on, uh, Luxembourg really um, put in place a legal framework that has been used and, and tested uh, for the issuance of securities uh, through uh, DLT and blockchain technology. I think this morning uh, there was already discussion around, for example, the EIB issues by the European Investment Bank. And those are issues under Luxembourg law that clearly uh, demonstrate that the Luxembourg uh, framework has been used and tried and tested also for important transactions by uh, established financial institutions. Uh, it's a framework that very much uh, builds on the framework for dematerialized securities uh, that is already in place and, and in very simplified terms basically allows the issuer uh, to create an, an issuer account uh, that is held by a settlement organization or a central account keeper, and that then, in turn, uh, through that account, um, it will be possible to hold the securities and to create a register that will primarily uh, rely on the DLT on blockchain technology without really having a need to re uh, having recourse to another register. So there's no need to uh, mirror that register or to, to create additional paperwork or bearer bonds or um, something like that. So that's a regime that is, is very flexible and that's also technology neutral. So there, the EIB, uh, some of the EIB transactions uh, used Ethereum. Um, so th there is a, a broad range of flexibility there. Uh, central account keepers initially uh, needed a dedicated approval, uh, but that has been broadened basically to also uh, credit institutions and investment firms, as long as they uh, demonstrate, for example, compliance with certain uh, security control measures, um, certain measures around securing the, the bookings, and, and so on. Uh, so I think a regime that is very flexible, that is um, neutral as to technology, and that has been applied in practice in the EIB transactions using different currencies. One of the last transactions uh, used, uh, for example, uh, British pounds, that also relied on smart contracts uh, for the payment of certain uh, coupons, that also had an interaction with uh, central banks, 
uh, that were intervening in, in the cash uh, settlement. And I think it will be interesting to see uh, when there are ongoing discussions about central bank digital money, how that will link up with uh, this, uh, this existing regime. Also, maybe to know that Luxembourg also allows for listing. Uh, there's a specific uh, regime around an official list uh, of securities that allows the securities to be listed if they are uh, distributed with uh, qualified investors or if they um, meet a certain minimum investment. And that creates, I think, an additional uh, visibility and, and, and shows that uh, the, the market is, is really uh, considering this as an, an integral part of the of the development of the, the market infrastructure. Maybe a last uh, remark, and I think that generally ties in with things that are attractive in the, the existing uh, legal regime in Luxembourg. Uh, the law was uh, a few weeks or even a week ago uh, implemented in, in Lux amended in Luxembourg to implement the certain amendments around the DLT uh, pilot regime. Uh, but at the same time, we amended our financial collateral law. Uh, the Luxembourg financial collateral law, which is um, very flexible and, and very easy um, to use for enforcement of um, security, a security interest over collateral. And that has been amended to indeed make very clear that digital securities are clearly in the scope of the financial instruments that can be um, within um, this very smooth uh, enforcement regime. So we have often seen double lux calls, for example, in um, structuring of financing transactions where you try to avoid uh, very cumbersome enforcement regimes in certain European jurisdictions and you rely on a structure in Luxembourg that will very clearly uh, apply to, um, uh, to digital securities as well. So when we are entering in maybe more uncertain times and, and parties will look at what happens in case of restructuring, then I would say a Luxembourg law can also be a, a great tool in, in creating robust structures for creditors and, um, and not only having a creative structure from the start, but also something that, that will help you uh, when it comes to um, potential enforcement. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but just a very uh, quick wrap up. I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, Luxembourg and France are probably um, the most advanced regimes when it comes to the tokenization of debt, which is also proven by um, Really established issues, choosing those, uh, choosing those um, jurisdictions as, as as governing law for the for their tokenized debt transactions. Um, I think uh, Germany is actually doing uh, quite well um, with their new legal framework, and uh, over time will probably become um, very well established as well. Um, the UK, I mean, uh, yeah, there is no uh, there is no legal framework, but uh, UK law has proven uh, very adaptable in the past, to be quite honest, and um, it's uh, it's actually worked uh, to their advantage in many ways in the traditional capital markets that it provides this type of flexibility. So um, I I, w I wouldn't write you off yet, Tom. <laughs> Um, and well, thank you very much uh, for listening from our side and looking forward to catch up uh, during the conference.